What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. I've got some sad news. Film icon Sean Connery died today. He lived from 1930 to 2020, and I've been expecting some bad news on this front for a while because we hadn't heard anything about him in quite some time. And I figured I would just do a little tribute video counting down... I don't know if it should be my top 10 favorite roles by Sean Connery, my top 10 favorite movies, or somewhere in between. Uh, the good news is I still have some Sean Connery films left to see that I hear are pretty good, but I was tempted to just go all in, write up this giant tribute, get a bunch of clips prepared, but then I figured maybe the best thing to do is just to be brief, be sincere, and be seated, and just wing it. I, I, I prefer to write most of my videos and then kind of read slash improvise, but maybe the best thing to do is just uh, speak from the heart because Sean Connery was just, he was, he was one of a kind. And I was a teenager when he was in the middle of his massive comeback. In the late 80s, he suddenly started picking up some, some serious momentum. And while he was no longer the young leading man that he had been in the 60s when he was doing all of his James Bond films, Suddenly, he was doing things like The Untouchables and Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. I'll, I'll never forget, I was 13 years old watching Indiana Jones in the theater with my mom. And I'm watching all these interactions, and I keep kind of recognizing Indiana's father. And finally, I turned to my mother. I was like, that's James Bond. And I remember thinking, I, was, I thought I was really cool. And she was like, yeah, obvious dumbass, like that's Sean Connery, because my mother was a giant Sean Connery fan. But in the years after that, Hunt for Red October and like little cameos and Robin Hood, Rising Sun. He just he just kept sticking around. Even like big giant blockbusters like The Rock. And obviously he did plenty of turkeys as well. The, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is one of the worst movies I've ever seen and one of the worst adaptations you could ever possibly imagine. But there's no denying that over the course of, I guess, like 50 years, he just racked up this extraordinary filmography. His career actually goes all the way back to 1954 with an uncredited role and Let's Make Up. I don't know if he was still in bodybuilder mode at that point or not, but he was absolutely jacked as a young man. But I do get incredibly sentimental about the period during the late 80s, early 90s, where he just suddenly appeared to be everywhere. But I guess the people that are going to be most sentimental are people that are my dad's age. My dad was born in 1950, so he was a child when Dr. No and From Russia With Love and Goldfinger and so on and so forth just took the world by storm. And the world just went James Bond crazy. I mean, I remember hearing about how in a documentary that when Goldfinger played, they would just play it round the clock at certain theaters and people just... Love this guy. It's funny. I wish I could claim that I was like an early Sean Connery buff, but when I first got into James Bond, um, For Your Eyes Only was on HBO, and so that was my introduction. And then I'll never forget looking at the newspapers uh, with my dad like a year or so later, and Octopussy and Never Say Never Again were playing at the same time. And I remember being so confused because I was already invested in Roger Moore as Octopussy, and that's what we were going off to see. And it had that great poster with all the arms, etc. And he was trying to explain to me who Sean Connery was, but I didn't see my first Sean Connery Bond I think I was 11. I started with Goldfinger and I was just absolutely enthralled. Just loved it. But before I dive into my top 10, I should admit there's some big Sean Connery films that I haven't seen. I've never seen The Name of the Rose, which I know a lot of people love. One of my biggest embarrassments is I've never seen A Bridge Too Far, which I hear is one of like the all-time great war films. And I've never seen The Anderson Tapes, which is directed by Sidney Lumet. So those are probably my top three like uh, Sean Connery films on my to-do list. But let's just dive right into my top 10 movies. And the first one, I'm kind of embarrassed, but there's no denying that people just absolutely love this, myself included. But for my number 10, I've got The Rock. And I haven't seen this movie in over 20 years. It might have aged from wine into vinegar. I, I really don't know. And I, I have a feeling that Nicholas's Ca Nicholas Cage's performance has probably aged less favorably because he was in full-blown crazy action mode. I mean, between that and Con Air and Face Off, Nicholas Cage was just having a, um, a strange moment in his career, but you know, he's getting paid up the wazoo. But Sean Connery was just the show stealer. And it, was, it had an incredible cast. Ed Harris is really good in it. But Sean Connery, I think it was the last time that I remember him being full of all that swagger and that confidence that we associate with James Bond. Obviously, he's an old man at this point. 
but he's all these lines about like like do your best like like losers do your best like winners go home and fuck the prom queen or i can't remember the exact line but something along those lines it just fit right in with that michael bay style of storytelling at that time it would be great if i had an opportunity to revisit all of these to see how my feelings are cha have changed but once again you're talking about a movie that came out when i was uh like 20 so I have no idea if it still belongs in this list, but my emotions and my, my, and my heart tells me that it does. And for my number nine, I'm going to go with a movie that I didn't see for the first time until a couple of years ago, but I'm going to go with John Borman's Zardoz. Now, John Borman's one of my all-time favorite filmmakers. He did things like Deliverance and Point Blank and Excalibur. Zardoz is not on that level, but it's one of those true cultural oddities that it's just, it's so strange you can't even begin to pitch it. <laughs> like, anyway, it's a sci-fi film. It's kind of a fantasy film, and you basically have like two societies living side by side. One's really advanced, one's really primitive, but the really advanced society has forgotten certain things. Like they no longer know how to make a man's penis go from flaccid to aroused. And so, of course, Sean Connery is uh, brought in to kind of illustrate how, how, to, how to get it done. And it's just a deliriously insane movie that's unlike anything else. And whether you just watch it to laugh at the strangeness of it or whether you get totally invested, I guess it doesn't really matter. But it's Sean Connery, Charlotte Rampling, in their prime, getting weird, and I absolutely love it. But for my number eight, I'm going to go with one that's a little bit more serious, The Hill from 1965. And this was directed by Sidney Lumet. A few years prior, he'd done 12 Angry Men. I mean, Sidney Lumet is one of the all-time great directors. And this was an opportunity for Sean Connery in the middle of his James Bond superstardom to show that he had some serious chops as an actor. And it's a really grim, gritty film about men in a military prison during World War II. It's probably not the most lighthearted movie to watch on the day of Sean Connery's death, but it gets a very strong recommendation on my part. And for my number seven, I'm going to go with Alfred Hitchcock's film Marnie. Now, Marnie comes in 1964. We're getting to the end of Alfred Hitchcock's like really rich, great period as a filmmaker. Some would argue that Frenzy it shows that he still had a lot of gas left in the tank, even as late as the early 70s. But Marnie, for me, is this transition film where you start to see what kind of movies Alfred Hitchcock might have made if he had been a filmmaker in a different era, a more modern era with slightly less censorship because Marnie in a lot of ways feels like a Brian De Palma film. And it's just a really perverted, sadistic thriller in a lot of ways with a lot of interesting psychological hysteria. But if you compare it to some of the films that Hitchcock was working on 10 years earlier, it just feels like night and day. It feels like he's gone from G to an X rating. And I think a lot of people sleep on this and they think, oh, well, early 60s Hitchcock, you just got to watch Psycho and the Birds and you're done. I disagree. Marnie's well worth a look. And over time, it keeps climbing the ranks, how it compared to the rest of Alfred Hitchcock's work. And for my number six, I'm going to go with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, where he played Professor Henry Jones, Indiana's father. What's funny is how he and Harrison Ford weren't that far apart in age, but Harrison Ford was still like young and ripped and shredded, and Sean Connery suddenly was appearing to be a much older man. But their chemistry was undeniable. It becomes this incredible father-son story, and I just love the way that Harrison Ford calls his dad sir and shows so much respect. But Sean Connery just crushed the role. It was absolutely fantastic, and it, ha and it has some really heartfelt moments like at the very end when Indiana is desperately reaching for the grail and he's about to fall down in this chasm to his death and his father very calmly says Indiana like let it go and it just it gives me goosebumps every time I think about it and uh, yeah it's just one just one of the essential films from my childhood that I watched over and over again but uh, moving into my top five Highlander a lot of people out there like to mock this movie. I don't understand why, because the movie absolutely kicks ass. I think a lot of people are just really afraid of having a good time, but this is a fantasy film with queen and sword fights and all sorts of incredible training sequences. But Sean Connery plays Ramirez, who dresses like a Spanish peacock, but he's actually Egyptian, but he wields a Japanese blade. This is a guy who's traveled all around the world, and it's his job to get Connor McCloud prepared for when he inevitably will have to face Kurgan, played by Clancy Brown. And as Ricky Bobby famously said in Talladega Nights, this movie got the Academy Award for the best movie ever made. And I totally agree. This movie is just shameless good fun from start to finish. It makes you feel like you can run through walls when you're watching it. But the scene between him and Connor on the beach just makes me smile from ear to ear. Once a week, I go meet with my trainer over this gym in Chelsea Piers. And we just constantly quote that one scene on the beach as a way of getting ourselves psyched up. And it's just wonderful, beautiful, magical stuff. And for my number four, we have a movie that could 
could have just as easily been my number one, but obviously number one is going to be James Bond. So for my number four, I'm going with the character of Jim Malone in Brian De Palma's film The Untouchables from 1987. Sean Connery actually took home an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for this role, but this is one of the most entertaining movies of the 1980s. It's a prohibition-era gangster movie. We've got Elliot Ness and his small elite team trying to take down Al Capone, and Sean Connery's there to guide him along the way, trying to figure out how to navigate Chicago. He's got that great line about how, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but essentially like if one of them puts one of your guys in the hospital, you put one of their guys in the morgue, like that's the Chicago way. Or that immortal line where right before he gets killed, spoiler alert, he says, oh, ain't that just like a wop, bringing a knife to a gunfight. And, I, and forgive me, I cannot do a Scottish accent. I would love to be able to do a Scottish accent. I've been to Edinburgh where uh, Sean Connery was born a couple times. And that is a, a beautiful accent that's very hard to imitate. Although he kind of does an Irish accent that doesn't quite work in The Untouchables because no matter what part Sean Connery is playing, he always sounds Scottish. Like Except for, I guess, the early Bond films, he sounds a little bit more English, but that Scottish accent just cannot be denied. In any event, in a career that had many peaks and valleys, this is definitely one of the brightest shining moments in Sean Connery's amazing career. And for my number three, I'm going with Robin and Marion from 1976. This is a film where I have Tony Stella, the poster designer, to thank for actually exposing me to the movie. But this is a tale about Robin Hood at a much later stage in his life when he's been off with Richard the Lionheart fighting in the Crusades for 20 years. And it's just an incredibly heartfelt and moving story. It's an incredibly romantic story. We have all these great scenes between Sean Connery and Audrey Hepburn, neither of whom are in the bloom of life. But it's an incredibly passionate love story. Richard Lester directed it. He's the guy who did like like Hard Day's Night, as well as The Three Musketeers. He's a really good director, but this is arguably his best movie. And what's really cool about it is how it pits Sean Connery once again against Robert Shaw, who plays the Sheriff of Nottingham, who obviously was one of his chief antagonists and from Russia with Love. But if you enjoy myths and legends set during medieval times with a little gritty authenticity thrown in for good measure, Robin and Marion gets my highest possible recommendation. And from a number two, we're getting into one of my all-time favorite movies, The Man Who Would Be King from 1975, directed by John Huston, starring Sean Connery as Daniel Dravet and Michael Caine as Peachy Carnahan. And this is one of those movies that my dad kept pushing on me and kept recommending that I watch. Finally, he just bought me the VHS cassette. And my friends and I in college, I think we were sophomores, we just popped it in on a whim and we were completely enthralled. I mean, this is one of those movies where it is a tale of high adventure with disastrous consequences where these two former British soldiers decide that they're going to basically march into the middle of nowhere and make themselves kings. And I always point to this movie as one of the best examples of how to adapt literature or novellas into movies because Roger Kipling, he wrote many big novels, but The Man Who Would Be King is a pretty slender little novella. And when you adapt a short story, you can flesh it out and make it breathe and make it more visual and more cinematic. Whereas when you're adapting a giant book, you're constantly trying to figure out like, all right, what do we cut? What do we cut? Like you're always condensing and stripping away. And I feel like movies in essence are a visual art form. And so short stories, I always feel like are ideal candidates to be fleshed out into movies. But in the end, what makes this movie just soar is this incredible camaraderie and just the power of the friendship between Sean Connery and Michael Caine. I don't think either actor has ever been better. Their, their laughter is so infectious. The way they light up their cigars is so infectious. Everything they do, you're like, I just, I want to be these guys. I want to be their friend. I, I, I'll, I'll carry their rifles. I'll, I'll, I'll carry their saddlebags. Like, just let, just let me be in the same room with these guys because they're the coolest guys who ever lived. But if you've never seen The Man Who Would Be King, that's probably my favorite standalone movie of any of the movies on this list. And as I already said earlier, obviously for my number one favorite role of Sean Connery, it's got to be James Bond. I mean, if I decided to do standalone movies in this list instead of roles, I mean, the James Bond, it would have taken up half the movies on this list. I didn't want to completely ignore some of his other amazing roles in other movies. But this is obviously a franchise that is still going strong, what, 60 years after its inception? I think Dr. No was like in 1961. It's absolutely incredible that they've been able to keep this going. I guess if you really want to tally up the true age of the franchise, it's nearly 70 years old, because I think the first book, which was Casino Royale, was published in the early 50s. It's a damn good read. I strongly recommend it. But if I were to rank my favorite Sean Connery Bond films, <sighs> I'm always changing my mind. I used to say Goldfinger just because that was my first exposure to him as Bond. But as I've gotten older, From Russia With Love keeps kind of sneaking back to the top. Thunderball is always kind of fighting for position. You know, You Only Live Twice is always fighting for a spot. 
I, I like Dr. No. I think Dr. No, they were still trying to figure out the formula and it had a much lower budget. So Dr. No has these incredible scenes, in particular the scenes with Ursula Andrus, Andrus on the beach when she's like, are you looking for shells? And he's like, no, I'm just looking. And all these amazing behind the scenes pics of them doing cartwheels and handstands on the beach. And I believe they were lovers at the time as well. And then James Bond franchise is one of those franchises that's had many ups and downs over the years. And I think the Sean Connery films though, all have aged pretty damn well, especially from Rush With Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball, You Only Live Twice. It's kind of tough to top those four. That's kind of the essence of James Bond. But I hope you'll forgive just how kind of crude and rough this video was. I just decided to, it'd be better to speak from the heart than trying to get super organized ahead of time. I just wanted it to be something that I could just rip right out. And also I probably should have mentioned ahead of time, I'm fighting this horrible eye infection in my left eye. So if it looks like I've been crying this whole video, as the old expression goes, like, I'm not crying, like you're crying. But it's a sad day, but if you want to honor Sean Connery's legacy, like go out and play 18 holes of golf, drink some single malt scotch, watch some of his movies. It is sad that he's gone, but he left behind this extraordinary body of work. And like I said, I'm still not done with the journey. I guess there are a ton of movies that I didn't even mention, movies that I've thoroughly enjoyed. They just didn't make the top 10, but he was one of the greats and he'll be missed. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider sharing it, liking it, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell, all that good stuff. And if you want to talk more about Sean Connery, hunt me down on Twitter at Corbrex, but I can't thank you enough for watching the video. I really appreciate it, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.